So tonight, uh, what I'd like to cover um, is not just the fantastic diversity of beautiful and brilliantly coloured ancient woodland plants and trees that we've got in the UK. But I'd like to just take a little snippet and look back at woodlands and how they've been managed um, over time. Have a look at woodland ecology that makes this whole cycle of life happen. And that's fundamental with the role of the fungi. We'll touch on soils. I was chatting to a friend last night who said you could give hour long talks on all of these topics, if not greater. So we're gonna condense it and we're gonna have a big cover and overview of, of, of woodland ecology. And then we'll look at some of the indicators, what makes a, a plant or an animal maybe a, a woodland indicator. And then that time of year when we can't really see the leaves on the trees, but the trees are still out there and we can maybe try and identify some of the trees in the winter or the early spring. Um, so you can get out tomorrow over the weekend and, and see if you can recognize any, any features on these trees. So. Um, so just to give us that perspective, to set, set the scene, where our woodlands have come from, it's important to take a step back in their development. So our woodlands, um, before human interaction and human management, were known as wildwoods, but we don't have any wildwoods in the UK. Everything's been managed to some degree. Um, but after the ice age, after the glaciation, uh, our woodlands and soils have developed on this very bouldery kind of muddy glacial debris in the UK and the seeds were brought in by wind or by birds and, and animals and, and started this whole ecology really and the whole uh, development of the ecosystem of the woodland. Um, and that period where we had wildwoods in the UK is known as the Atlantic period in the Holocene and it was about 6,000 BC to about 4000 BC and it was the time before we had permanent settlers so there would have been Mesolithic and and um, Paleolithic hunter-gatherers but they might have had an impact on the woodlands to some degree but they certainly weren't living and managing woodlands um, in Scotland the climate's different and there's a Caledonian pine forest and if we have a look at this little diagram, we can see the extent of this wild wood. So the colour we've got here, we've got um, in the south and east, we've got mainly lime, which is very uh, rare nowadays um, for lots of lots of different reasons. But then you've got the oak and the hazel riding up towards the southern highlands. You've got hazel and elm dominating. Um, in southwest Wales, and then in Scotland, the Caledonian Forest, and then Birch, and then the top of Scotland and the Outer Hebrides were the limit for tree growth. So that's more towards the Arctic tundra kind of natural vegetation. So a kind of look at our woods that we once had in Britain, but now we've got so much management that's happened over thousands of years, and we've got all the species that represent in these old woodlands. But how do we know all this? Um, if we take a look at the study of pollen analysis, I mean, the first pollen were identified in the 1880s. Um, and then since the 30s, the science of analyzing pollens and trying to work out um, our history by looking at, at, at pollen grains um, has been going since the 1930s. So as an example of this, if you haven't come across these before, each pollen grain is unique. So this one's a species of goldenrod, this one's an oak pollen, there's pine and there's grass, just as an example. So by analysing under a microscope, you can see the different nature of the pollen. And you can look at the relative abundance of them on this chart over here. And you can, using carbon dating techniques, you can work out when. So say 10,000 years BC was the late Paleolithic period. And you can see lots of herbaceous plants a little bit of willow and lots of silver birch. And then you come to the early Neolithic and the herbs have gone down, alder has increased, oaks increased, elm and hazel, so on. And then come the late Iron Age, many more heather plants, more herbs, uh, willow, ash, alder, lime, still there, oak, 
hazel, Scots pine. So you can see that there's this natural, as the climate change, there's a natural change in the, in the natural vegetation. And this is all understood by looking at these um, soil samples or sediment samples when they're carbon dated at a date and age. And then these pollen grains are indestructible and they're um, made of a, an organic material, really stable, resists rot. And say a plants like willow, which we're coming out soon, you get the thousands of, of um, windblown um, pollen from there and, and these are the seeds as well but you, you've just got on a birch tree there's something like five and a half million pollen grains in a little cat in the catkin and there's thousands of catkin on one tree so some species produce vast amounts of pollen and they're really good indicators for this kind of um, understanding of our, of our back of our history. So if we look at the wooden structure, so in temperate Britain, we have a structure where we can broadly describe, we've got these canopy forming trees. You can see there the tall canopy forming tree. And then you've got this slightly lower understory. So you've got woody shrubs and, and hazel and certain species that don't climb up to the canopy, but form this under layer. And then you've got this, what we call a field layer. Um, and they're made of, climbers and creepers like brambles and ivy and honeysuckle and and uh, dog rose and then you've got the ground layer and we're going to look at all these different species that we find in our on our woodland floor and the herbs the non-woody plants and we'll we'll be looking and describing some of those as we go through the evening so we've looked at wild woods so since people have lived and had permanent settlements in the UK since the Neolithic time, we've been managing woodlands. And the first settlers showed evidence of, of farming and woodland clearances for, uh, and um, woodlands have got such a phenomenal resource for food, for grazing, timber, for firewood. Um, and by the Bronze Age, something like 50% of the wildwoods had disappeared. So there's an old theory that you could have a squirrel that would have um, climbed a tree in John uh, Land's End and climbed all the way to Scotland to John O'Groats without touching the ground. That kind of concept of a continuous woodland cover across our country is, isn't strictly that true because we had lots of herbivores and grazing animals. There would be large areas of of uh, open grasslands really, and savannah within the woodland. So there was a, a mixture of grassland and woodland. It wasn't pure woodland cover, but of the wildwoods, half of it had disappeared. So Britain was 50% woodland cover. And then by the middle ages, we we're down to 7% um, due to expansion of cultivation, uh, a big population expansion as well. So, some of the earliest woodland management are woodland pastures for grazing animals and wood coppices, which we'll touch on in a minute. So this is an overview and there's a link at the bottom. I'll share the presentation with you at the end if you're, you'd like to look at these in a little bit more detail. Uh, Wales has got 15% woodland cover. England has got 13% woodland cover and Scotland is 19% in woodland cover. So you can see the darker the green, the greater the, the, the woodland cover. Um, but what we've got is managed woodlands and there's something like uh, uh, Rackham in the, eight, in the 2003, or was it 2003? He did the vegetation classifications and came up with 83 different types of woodland in the UK. So there's a huge variety of woodlands based on what trees dominate the canopy and what ground vegetation dominates the, the herb layer. Um, so there's a huge variety of woodlands due to this, this history of management. And evidence in, in old maps, we've got um, clay hill copse and a copse is an old word for a coppice. Um, there's another pond house, Cops there, the hollies, so that would uh, 
relate to holly trees being in the area, maybe historically. The poplars, so um, again, poplar trees, which are less common now, and scratch face, <laughs> unusual name for that copse there. So you can see how these old maps had um, probably a tithing map here, or, or, but, they, but they just show the extent of the, the copse, but also uh, the different types of woodland management. Um, and the, the importance of them. They all, like villages, they all had, they all had names and, and woodlands crop up in all over the UK in, in different names. So here's an example of a wood pasture. So a wood pasture lacks shade adapted plants. So on the ground, we've got grass cover, grassland cover. We've got some quite big trees quite a few trees, but not permanent shade. So it's quite an open managed environment. Um, there's another example. So you've got different grazing animals, different types of grazing animals that we've, we've got in these woodland pastures. And our woodland pastures have declined massively over the centuries. Um, so that kind of habitat was really common, but think woodlands or wood pastures have either become less um, grazed or, or and less wooded and more grazed or they become more covered in woodlands as well so there's more regeneration so that whole um, agricultural land management technique has has kind of gone by the wayside to some extent and we've got a lot of parklands in Britain so these came in with the um, fallow deer like we've got there and the pheasant and rabbits were introduced by the Normans and they brought in these parks and these parklands where they, they semi-domesticated and managed the deer, um, not for hunting, but for, for venison. So they were, when the Normans came in, the Doomsday Book recorded something like 35 parks in Britain. And then by 1300, so 120 years later, there were 3,000 parks here, really massive expansion of old woodlands being converted into parklands and parts of these great big estates. Other types of woodland environment that we've got um, from that period, medieval period, we've got the, the, the big estates that were divided up. Uh, commons were, were given um, and developed as a type of wood pasture as well. So. Um, these are common grazing rights um, from the medieval times, part of these big, big, big estates and manors. And some still remain. An example is Burnham Beach in Buckinghamshire. That's quite a famous one. And this was on the way down to Western Burt. I can't remember the exact name of this, um, but it's unusual to have lime on, on these woodland commons. But again, it's different types of management and you will find different species associated with them. So the woodland pastures have declined. Uh, some have become more wooded, some have become fields, some have become golf courses, and some have become plantations and there's afforestation. Um, and we've got in the UK lots of afforestation going on. There's lots of tree planting schemes, huge schemes all over the country, which are fan is fantastic. So old grazed areas which are now um, being reverted to woodland. Some of them are, are, are for, you know, uh, conservation management reasons, but others are for carbon capture. So we've got this a transition and a thinking in our land management. But plantations, we've got these exotic species. This was just illustrates that light does penetrate through some of them, and that will affect what grows on the on the ground and the vegetation. Some of them are very dense, but these exotic species um, have been in the country for 300 or so years. And a lot of these plantations that we've got that occurred after the First World War and then the Forestry Commission have come from like the West Coast of America and we've got Douglas fir and these are, I think they're grand fir, um, but different species are planted in different areas for different reasons. But we had a, a massive increase of um, forest cover in Britain. Half of Britain's forests are now plantations as well. So half our cover, woodland cover is, is, a, is plantation. Um, but we've had this big increase since the First World War because we needed a resource um, and materials and, and woodland products and things.
another classic um, woodland management technique is is a coppice, and it's a, a regular crop of wood. This is a hazel coppice. You can see the open nature of the canopy is going to affect what can grow on the ground because it's quite an open canopy structure. Um, the trees are cut down down to the, a low stool, and it's sustainable. Sustainable technique. Hazel may grow without uh, coppicing to maybe eighty years, but with coppicing can grow well over three hundred years in age, if not older. So they they really respond well to to management and. It maintains a soil structure and fertility and an open canopy. And the, the species that enjoy that open canopy, we get specific species, which we'll talk about some of them, that like coppiced environments. Some coppices, like a hornbeam down in the southeast of England, where hornbeam grows well on clay soil, and they form a very dense canopy. And you can see the ground vegetation is brown leaves. It, 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 it doesn't afford itself to a great ground cover of species because in the summer it has a very very dense canopy so species like meadow sweet will suffer they love that environment the clay damp soil but they they disappear and then we've got things that we we're probably more familiar in terms of the name of ancient woodlands and these are woodlands which have had continual woodland cover for at least 400 years. So there's a threshold date of 1600 AD uh, when we had those early maps that show that an area is wooded. Um, and in these woodlands, we get species which indicate uh, that that area has been wooded. And this is something that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and when we look at the species later on, this will kind of come in those commonalities with some of the species. But it's not just the plants that are woodland indicators. We have a whole array of, of uh, lichens and moss, which indicate a woodland has been there. So these can't jump from one woodland to another or from an open area to a woodland. So they, they, they only survive within that woodland environment. So the presence of them indicates that there's been this continual woodland cover. We also get ground beetles, which are are ancient woodland indicators. They can't survive outside of a woodland environment. They're specialists in their job. Um, and so when you've got those species present, then we have these natural bio, biological indicators. And then the plants themselves. So we look at that and it's marsh marigold. Marsh indicates it's a wet woodland as well, but they have this form which creeps. And I'll just demonstrate uh, some of the features of these botanical, these plant ancient woodland indicators. This plant is common cow wheat. Um, and I'll use that as an example in a second, but woodland indicators have this growth which spreads and sprawls and creeps and grows by cloning itself. So they don't reproduce necessarily well by um, setting seed, but they do really well by underground runners and overground runners and things like that. So they spread, and they can form great big mats. They love damp conditions, they love damp soils, they love shade, and they're often insect pollinated because woodland will have less wind, so the wind isn't as reliable for these low species. They're not good competitors at all, so you take away the canopy and these will get outcompeted by faster growing species like grasses, for instance. And the role of ants for dispersal. So the reason putting this um, image in here of cow wheat is there's a special relationship with um, ants and this plant. So these the seeds are made by this plant that look and smell and are the exact same size as um, ant eggs. So they mimic the ant eggs and they smell like the ant eggs and the plant in the little flower produces some sugary substance to entice them in and then they see this egg-like structure and they carry that egg or that seed to their nest and that helps that plant to be dispersed. So the role of ants for dispersing is really, really important. Ramsons, wild garlic has exactly the same mechanism, although they don't look and smell just like the uh, the egg of an ant. But so these plants, it's a parasitic plant partly, so it relies upon 
photosynthesizing, but also takes food from the roots of plants and fungi. Um, but it's got this really interesting ecology, how it's developed. And that's an indicator of a, a woodland uh, species. And then you get species which come into leaf in the spring, early spring, like we're seeing now. And some of them will flower now and will flower in the summer. So an example, again, this is a plant called dog's mercury and it's got this creeping habit and it covers and sprawls across a whole area. And that's a close up of it. Dog's mercury, a few little facts about it. Uh, it flowers at the moment, it'll be in flower now, but it, it, the flower is not very attractive looking in the sense that it's not a big um, flower attractive, insect attracting flower. Um, but if you get really closer, you, there's male and female plants. So the flowers on this plant will be different from a flower on, uh, on maybe a different plant. So then the word dioecia means two. It's an, uh, uh, die is two and isia is the root word in Greek for um, ecology and ecology means the study of homes. So this means it's got two homes and that term is for male and female flowers. So it loves damp conditions, shaded conditions and um, it's highly poisonous. It can grow up to a metre per year through its growth and it can dwarf out and shade out any other species that can form this dense map all by itself. So you might get a complete cover just of one plant like we've just explained there with dog's mercury but then you also get these things called gills and you find flowers and assemblage of different flowers together so we've got greater stitchwort and bluebells there's a pig nut in there as well so um, you wouldn't find bluebells with dog's mercury because dog's mercury uh, out competes most other species so you, you generally you might find a few other species with with dog's mercury, but generally um, tree seedlings can't even grow through that dense cover that they've got, so they can really dominate. And that's a, a feature of, of an ancient woodland indicator. Um, but other times you get these assemblages, so they can be really beautiful, colorful um, situations. So in terms of the ecology, just we'll whip through what's going on in the year in a woodland, in a temperate, uh, woodland where we've got open canopy cover, the leaves aren't there, and the ground gets heated up by the spring sun and plants like, it's not native, but it's been around for 2000 years since the Romans brought the snowdrops in. Those bulbs get heated up and stimulated and come out of their kind of dormancy from the winter by that sun's energy in the spring. And um, they start to, these spring flowers, these vernal species, take advantage of this open canopy. And then they carpet the leafless canopy in good sunlight. Um, but then come the summer when the leaf uh, canopy is formed, down below it's really dark as I'm trying to illustrate in this image here. So in the summer, these damp woodlands are really good for these epiphytes. So you get lots of, of cover of different species living on the branches like um, ferns and, and mosses and so on. But also in that dark light, we also get these parasitic plants. So bird's nest orchid is non-photosynthetic. Um, so it's lost its ability to take sun's energy. So it loves these dark, damp uh, woodlands in summer. They're parasitic on a fungus, which is also associated with a beech tree. So you'll find these bird's nest orchids flowering in the summer associated with beech trees. Um, but again, it just indicates in the summer we've got this ecology in Britain, which has got incredible diversity using light and moisture and, and things. Then come the autumn, all the goodness out of the leaves and the, the light absorbing pigments are removed, taken and stored in the, in the tree. Uh, repurpose um, into the buds for the next year and then the leaves fall off and we've got this whole cycle. So the acorn grows, it, it's germinated, it, it, it develops during the summer, then the leaves fall in the autumn and then they get 
recycled in the autumn. So that's our, our nitrogen cycle. We're going to spend five minutes just looking at this and the role of fungi. Um, so what does all this work for us? You know, without things that break things down and rot things, we basically have a buildup of this organic matter and these leaves. So we need these animals, which we call detritivores, which eat the dead and decaying matter. But the dead and decaying matter is uh, really tough. It's made of really big organic compounds like cellulose and lignin, which these organisms can't digest. So we rely on fungi and bacteria, which rot everything down. So they, they decompose and they digest all this material, which the animals can't um, digest. So those, these are absolutely critical. Little illustration of animals decaying leaf litter. And so this is about 20 seconds or so. You got wood lice and you got worms and they're just eating, digest, well, they're, they're eating, consuming. And now you've got the image of the rotting or the fungi, which are just starting to rot down and decompose fully all those, those organic compounds. But they're not as effective at reducing it as quickly as you'll see now with the animals that just start to take that leaf litter and bring it right the way down. So the two work side by side. So we need the animals that can chew and chomp, and then we need the fungi that can do the rotting as well. So they're really, really important. So the role of the fungi are there. Now, fungi are made up of these filaments called hyphae. We don't see these fungi and fungi are the most phenomenal group of organisms. They're not animals, but they are like animals because they can't make their own food, but they're not plants because they're not photosynthetic. So they have no chlorophyll. So they're a group all by themselves. There's about three or 5 million different species. They've evolved a billion years ago and the cells can actually divide so unlike animals and plants they're the only things that can then that animals and plants can't divide their cells um, and they digest food outside with enzymes so they don't ingest or digest internally but they they have these uh, enzymes and their cells are made of chitin which is what makes mammalian horns and claws and things. So they're kind of similar to animals in some way because they, they don't make food, but they're not plants and they're really unique. And they have these threads all come together in this thing called a mycelium. But we don't often see all of that. All we see are these fruiting bodies. And these fruiting bodies have spores and those spores find a new habitat to land on and to develop and grow into the bit that we don't see, which is what they do underground. Um, is to rot things down. Um, some of them, like the bracket fungus here, are not necessarily a bad sign of health for the tree, but they could be a good sign. Um, and they may actually help the tree survive longer. But by the time we see the, the fruiting body, the mycelium inside is rotting dead wood. And it could be have been doing that for a number of years. And then we get the fruiting body that pops out the side. So an old tree is quite heavy, full of dead wood, and that dead wood might be a burden to the to the old tree. So by rotting the core, it makes it a hollow tree, which is probably stronger. So these fungi can maybe reduce the, the mass of the, the tree and helping it survive longer. But also all that dead wood is then rotted and made available to the roots. It's also habitat for birds and, and all sorts of things. So these fungi are very beneficial in lots of ways. And without fungi, nothing, no plants would survive on land. So the transition of greening the earth from um, when the algae transitioned from water to land was only possible through the fungi. And you can see the, 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 the link, the fungi make associated not just with algae, but with, with you know, um, some cyanobacteria and, and 
we're going to come on to other associations that they've got but the fungi have that ability to break things down and, and to make accessible all the nutrients of which the algae can't so they've basically acted like the roots of plants to forage and get food and pass them on so that transition and these associations have gone on since plants came on to live on land and um, one thing I want to talk about here is this is a tree that I saw the other day upturned it's a beech tree and you can see how flat and shallow those roots are they're only a matter of inches deep that that root plate far thinner than the, the size of the trunk and the roots do a job of anchoring but it's really if we have a look at this photo on the roots they get these fungal cells fungal hyphae which uh, associate with the roots and there's this um, symbiosis this mutualistic relationship between the fungus and the root and it's called a mycorrhiza and these are three quarters of all living plants have a mycorrhiza they're really really important and um, these fine network of roots have an ability to to uh, get more food for the plant via its roots than that than the roots do themselves there's a little um, video again just 20 seconds these yellow uh, structures of the spores so these are those fungal spores and they go onto the roots and the sugars those green things are the sugars and they get made by the plant taken up by that fungi that mycelia and then they spread out and grow and find that fine network right the way through the soil so that just illustrates the importance of it and some of these associations are incredibly defined so in hazel you get a fungi, the fiery milk cap, and then we see the fruiting body there. So only with hazel will you find that. So these associations of mycorrhizae can be very, very specific. Like the sycna in pine, sometimes spruce, it's a poisonous um, fungi, but you'll only find it associated with the roots of pine. Fly agaric's a great example with, again, mainly birch, occasionally pine as well. Um, and the set is generally associated with beech. So in a beech woodland, you'll find the set, but you wouldn't find the fly agaric. So these are really, um, really significant associations. And then there's this concept which has been known about for a number of years, but it's been developing is quite a, a popular subject um, at the moment. So the plants making sugars and they're being passed down to the roots. And then these, these fungi and this mycelium are taking the sugar and they're growing and then they're returning nitrates and phosphates to the plant so the plant can make amino acids and things and there's this not just the association that we've got between the, the the root and the and the fungi but then the fact that these nutrients can be passed on to other components and other trees within that forest and so this wood wide web things are connected and it's really fascinating they've done radioactive traces and they found compounds being um, taken up by one tree and then passed through the roots and being given to another so the benefits and the health of the woodland they can prevent attack so if a tree is being attacked they can send chemicals our bodies rely on chemical transfer through our neurons for instance so these kind of processes are very very fast transfer and they can tell when something's being attacked and they can prevent um, and they can prevent unwelcome attack by uh, creating, spreading toxic chemicals and things. So it's a really interesting kind of world that we're just understanding more and more about. Um, so that's the wood wide web. So I just thought I'd touch on that today. And then before we look at some species, woodland soils are really, really varied. And again, you could give, I don't know how many of you would be uh, <laughs> interested, or, uh, but you could give hour long lectures on different types of soils. And they're so, the science of soils is, is a really interesting topic. Um, sadly not studies as much um, nowadays, but really, really important. Upland soils, we often get a, quite a deep, because it's heavy rain, uh, cooler climate, you get a buildup of organic 
matter. Um, in lowland soils, we get greater uh, recycling of that organic. It's warmer and the, the climate's better. So it's, you get a very different woodland soil structure. And then in wet soils, this area here is actually clay. So the texture of the soil um, it has, has changed and there's different, there's a lot of chemistry that goes on in soils. But I just thought I'd illustrate the fact that with certain soils, you get certain um, species. So you get lots of wood rushes associated with upland soils and bracken, for instance, and ferns. Lowland soils, a lot more of these, uh, what we consider as a colourful um, array of, of woodland indicator species. And then in wet soils, um, plants like herb parrot is quite rare nowadays. Uh, it likes wet soils, it, like, it, it, it spreads by underground rhizomes as well. Um, and that's a distribution map of it. So it, it's not common in Scotland at all, uh, more in the, the West Country really. Uh, not so much in Wales, but again, it's the type of soil that's really, really important as why you find a certain species where you do. Now, as I said, we would take a look at some species, so there are some plant species and some tree species. And I'll try to look at them in terms of what, uh, if it's a, a certain type of woodland or a certain soil type. So there's a little references to those as well. So now we're in the winter, it's really hard to out the winter into the spring. It's really hard to, to, to see the or identify the species by uh, in its winter coat. So here we've got a species and of tree and you've got this long pointy bud and you've got lots of little scales on this one. So there's many, many overlapping scales. It's long, thin, pointy not hairy, there's lots of characteristics you can look at to find the difference between different um, types of bud and characteristics. So in a few months, you'll get these lovely light, soft uh, lime green leaves and these long catkin flowers. And the tree itself, smooth bark, often um, been engraved and, and cut, but you can see it's, still quite you might know it by now but it's a beech tree um it's hard to identify them in the winter the leaves are the thing that gives the gives them away the main characteristic but so we have fagus sylvatica 40 meters high it'll flower from april and may and here you see the flowers are out with the leaves both male and female flowers on the same tree and woodlands of beech are very shady and they they don't really have much vegetation on the ground. We saw the bird's nest orchid a little bit earlier and that had um, that parasitic plant that was parasitic on the fungus that was that had a mutualistic relationship with the roots of the beech tree. Um, so certain plants are associated with it, um, shade tolerant species. Um, and the old, um, it's a bit like a, a, a wood cop, uh, yeah, the panage. A bit like um, a, a, a common in a way where you're allowed to graze in woodlands. Here you're allowed to have panage in, in beech trees. So every number of years, there'd be a great beech mast and pigs were allowed to forage for like 60 days or so underneath uh, uh, in a beech woodland. Um, and here in the early spring, kind of April time, you get beautiful light that's to go, that shines through a, a beech woodland. And again, you can get this species that again, characteristic of a woodland, um, it's, uh, it spreads um, their bulb flowers, but they, they just spread and carpet an area. They can dominate as well as have this interaction with other species. So you get these fantastic bluebell shows. It's one of the delights really of uh, British wildlife spectacles. And again, it's in the beach woodland, this example. So they really, really, enjoy that um, beach environment. Um, you can see the flower there in, in close up. So the bluebell flowers from April, so it won't be long now before we'll be able to see them for ourselves. Um, it was once popular to pick bluebells, but now it's discouraged. Um, 
lots of things were were harvested and collected and, and gathered but now it's it's illegal to uproot them um but a lot of species have suffered huge decline in their population but it's not necessarily due to being picked or the flowers being picked hold explain that again and in, in some other species just uh, as we go through so another tree species do you know what it is it's it's one that people recognize because it's got these characteristic black buds and on the stem um, there they come in opposite each other not alternate so that's a characteristic but th underneath these buds they're not all flower um, leaf buds so these are the flowers popping out through and again the flowers are coming out before the leaves so this is a um, interesting the beach they came out together but on this species you can see uh, you got male these are female flowers and male flowers so sometimes you get separate trees with separate male and female flowers sometimes you get them on the same tree and sometimes you even get them within that flower could be male and female and again it's in the winter it's very hard to uh, identify them maybe when they look like that but you'll see the leaves come out in the next two months. They'll be out in April time. So the flowers before the leaves appear, um, they're dioecious, but sometimes monoecious, as I said, and they prefer fertile, deep and well-drained soils in a cold climate. So um, they love calcium. They're indicators of calcium rich bases, very fertile soils. So they quite happy getting their feet wet. Um, but they're also so they're happy in the mountains and they're happy in the lowlands. Um, but they're particularly happy when they get rich bases. So another tree, a uh, little bit more unusual, less common nowadays. Um, you get one big scale and one little scale, typically red, sometimes greeny red. And then the leaves pop out here. Um, they've been in massive decline across the UK, but they, the two forms, one with a big leaf, one with a small leaf, uh, might give it away. Um, it's far less common to see those than it is the hybrid, which is known as um, common lime. And this nature of suckering at the base is really indicative of lime trees. So that's common lime. I'm using as the example flowers in July, so it's quite late. You can make a nice tea from the flowers. Um, the hermaphrodite, so male and female productive parts within the same flower. And then I've explained that there's the, the hybrid, which is more vigorous than the two and far more common. Um, so you're less likely to see, unless you go to a like an arboretum, you're more likely to see common lime. So a species that you might associate with the lime and the ash, is primrose and it's one of the earliest flowers that we'll see hence the name prim or prime which means fir so it's the first of the spring flowers it was a cash crop and it's been picked for hundreds of years really across the uk um, in wales you get this variety it's more likely to find this natural variety it is not garden escapes but you get this form as well in wales naturally um, I was just reading the other day that in South Devon uh, in 1978, they were still being harvested and sold in markets in London and uh, sold when they closed, but they'll flower for a couple of weeks if you bought a bunch of them. But 1.3 billion were, trend, were taken to London markets in 1978. So they've got this great history of, of being um, sold at market. But their demise and their decline in the country isn't to do with picking, but it's probably to do with habitat change, uh, less suitable, maybe more spraying or chemicals from farm. So a lot of species are in decline, not from habitat, uh, not from um, being picked or harvested. That's a common myth, a misconception. It's more to do with habitat and maybe other chemicals and climate possibly. Something I learned at school, there are two forms of the primrose. One's got like a little um, dot there and one has got, um, I'll show you a diagram to explain it. 
one has got the female uh, stigma there and one's got it really low down and one's got the male pollen on the anther here and one's got them high up so this one is here and there are two different forms pin and thromai and they're meant to um help insects not pollinate the same flower so to actually take the pollen from one and pollinate another flower to increase that um, fertility there so that's a uh, something that that i remember from school and it's it's you can still see so again if you're keen um all the primrose as well as it happens is uh they're edible flowers as well but and leaves um so yeah it's it's got its it's got its um visual uses and in the house and scent and but it's also um good for eating if they're I, I remember doing it once and I'm, i sugared so i dipped an egg white and then um put them i sugared them and had them as like a, a delicacy but probably best not only do it when there's abundance of these of these species so it likes heavy clay soils and damp shady area and they will form these great big mats so again damp heavy clays um hornbeam you'd find them with them and, and various other species so they're they're very soil dependent and environment dependent uh we've got here a plant that's again creeping form these leaves appear in the autumn these uh the the heart-shaped leaves these you'll see mats then come the autumn and the winter and the flowers are starting to appear now that's one close up you got you either get eight petals on these or 13 the fibonacci number of uh of, of petals i don't know why but there's there's some interesting patterns that you get with nature which Fibonacci kind of elucidated like 800 years ago. Um, it's called Lesser Celandine. Uh, again, damp shady woods, so a classic. These are wood, all these species I'm showing you are, not, are ancient woodland indicators. So they indicate a woodland has been present for at least 400 years. So these are classic woodland indicators, that sprawling clonal habit. An old name is pilewort, as it's tubers, which resemble piles, and was therefore thought through the doctrine of signatures as a cure for that ailment. And that just how cos showed how cosmopolitan it is and where it's found across the UK. So here's another very, very common woodland, ancient woodland indicator. Um, other Alternate name for it is the windflower. Its flowers open fully, like that one I've just shown there, only when it's in bright daylight. So when it's in a in a shady woodland, they don't open fully. But when they're in broad daylight, if they ever get out to broad daylight, then they open fully like that. They're barely fertile, so they rely on creeping underground. Um, although they grow very very slowly, and they'll grow. I think it's six feet in a hundred years. So they're incredibly slow growing, but they form this carpet and mat. So they won't jump from one woodland to another woodland. So if you start, if you convert a field now to a woodland, you won't find wood anemones in there. Certainly not very quickly because they haven't got that ability to, because they're barely fertile. So um, they're uh, yeah, a true woodland, ancient woodland indicator. Honeysuckle is a climber again, a woodland indicator. The scent, beautiful, beautiful scent. Um, if you ever get a chance to smell them come June time, June, July, they're quite late, late flowering. Um, the scent is stronger in the evening. It's strong in the day, but much stronger in the evening. And it's because they're, they're moth pollinated. Okay, there just explains again. That it's fantastic beautiful scent and great in summer drinks as well if you wanted to add to that. Changing habitat now to a kind of a wetter woodland, uh, not very easy to, to identify from the bud, but if I was to show the next image, so we've got catkins, these are the female catkins, these are the male catkins, and as the catkins grow through 
the spring, the male catkins enlarge and then they release their pollen. So not easy, but it's a wetland environment. And they have, you can see all these catkins all the way to the top of the canopy and all the way down as well. So you'll see that, that feature on these near wetland areas and it's older. So they can tolerate acidic conditions, the alkali conditions. <clears throat> they love water rushing and flushing past them. They don't want to sit in waterlogged environments, but they like it when it flushes. And the, the seed, when it's developed, is um, waterborne. It germinates by being carried down in the river. So it needs that flowing water, and then it will germinate um, down along flood lines. So it's it's really interesting. It's not carried by animals. It's not by birds or anything. Or the, the wind, it's actually distributed by, by water. So it needs that wet environment, but not waterlogged. So there's a, a picture of older wood um, with kind of grassy. Um, you can see kind of sprouting from the base. That's a characteristic as well. So these suckers and shoots that come up from the base. You might see golden saxophrase as well in that environment. So again, damp, damp woodland um, floor. Golden saxophrase loves that environment, as does this plant. So this plant has a ring of leaves, like a rough. Um, its name may have come from, from that, um, or it may have come from the fact that it roves. It's a roving uh, spreading plant. So again, it's that woodland ancient woodland indicator. Um, once called sweet woodruff, um, it's now woodruff. Uh, it's used as a domestic freshener. And in Germany and Austria, um, it's one of the ingredients in a drink called Maibol, which they use a, a wine made in the Rhine or the Moselle area, and they add it to sugar and orange. And then they use the, the sweet flavor from the woodruff in this punch that they make in May time in that area. So um, if you come across it, um, four petals, four white petals on that, and then this really distinctive ring of leaves that you get. So it is a rough or is it a rove? I don't know, but it's, it's certainly, these are not easy to see because uh, they're quite diminutive, but when you get a big bank of them in there, you know, in May time when they're absolutely in flower, then, um, you probably have the scent before you you uh, to see it. Here's something which I find is just the most beautiful um, wild flower, and in um, it's the national emblem of of Wales, uh, and it's Kenin Pedder in in Welsh. Uh, once widespread, it loves damp woodlands. These are tiny plants they're not like the the um the flowers that you buy in supermarkets these are really really small and they're um they suffered a massive decline in the 1850s and no one really understood why um wasn't due to picking um but this population is in a little protected area in north wales which has really seen a huge revival over the last 20 years by removing grazing pressure from this area and they've really responded well. So grazing pressure has really had an impact on these wild daffodils. They love these damp, base rich, fertile um, environments as well. So it's, it's a beautiful um, plant. If you ever get a chance to see them, um, that's a population in the UK where their red populations are where they are um, introduced. But up in North Wales, there's a small population, which is a native population. It's been there at least 40 years. It's been known about, it's a little reserve, it's been known about for at least 40, 50 years. Um, and in Wales, it was used uh, to flower graves on Mothering Sunday. So it's, it's uh, yeah, a delight to see. This flower is very, very distinctive. The leaves are out already. They've been out since January. They're arrow-shaped leaves, but the flower itself, it stinks of... <laughs> of we, it uh, attracts flea, uh, flies to pollinate. And it's got this really interesting um, kind of structure here, which will bear red berries later in the, in the season, but the flowers are way down here. It's names lords and ladies, uh, cuckoo pint, cuckoo flower, 
parson in the pulpit. There's lots of names for, for lords and ladies. Um, again, a creeping habit, uh, just a, a classic um, woodland indicator. Um, poisonous, best not to, to eat it or be tempted, but it's worth a smell if you get a chance to, to, to uh, see them in the next month or so. There's a classic one uh, that's in leaf at the moment. The scent you will see and, and, and notice the aroma is really strong. And again, they carpet and blanket an area. Um, beautiful uh, uh, array of, of, of color. This was up in the Lake District a number of years ago. So Ramsen's a strong woodland indicator. Doesn't like being coppice. So it's, it's of these unmanned, well, less managed, semi-natural woodlands. Um, yeah, all that plant is edible. It's lovely. It's got a lovely strong scent. Ants like to distribute the, the seeds from this as well. So it's a common um, spreads by that clonal growth. So it's a classic woodland indicator. A couple more trees to finish and a, and a couple of species. We'll run over a little bit. Um, so we've got their big club like um, bunch of, of buds and then the catkins that will appear at the same time as the leaves. And the tree itself has this grand shape, twisted gnarled branches. This is sessile oak, which is gregarious. It forms forests. English oak doesn't form forests. It doesn't really, unless it's planted, but sessile oak will naturally form oak woodlands. Um, so you get the, the beautiful long catkins on that. Um, can produce five million acorns in its lifespan, but it won't flower until it's 20 years old. There's an example of an oak woodland as well. So it's sessile oak will form these natural stands. There's a, a tree, more of a shrub, an understory uh, tree. One of my favorites really, because of the little uh, red flower that you get from January right in now. So you'll see this right now, but you'll know it by the lamb's ears or the, the telltale really at this time of year, lots of these all over the, the country at the moment. Um, so it's a stand that grows naturally uh, in that form uh, called hazel. So February, March, have a look, see if you can find those little red flowers. They're absolutely lovely. They live up to, I said this earlier, they live up to 80 years in the wild, but if they're coppice, they can have a much, much longer life. And it's a rich habitat supporting fertility butterflies, nightjar and dormice. So it's, it's an important habitat if you have a hazel coppice. Um, I think it's the final tree I've got. Not so familiar uh, these catkins that's a female flower and that's a male catkin but this very hanging uh, chandelier like um, fine branches that you get on the silver birch this pendula kind of uh, appearance betula pendula again you can tap wine this time of year uh, and uh, before the leaves come out there's an opportunity to, to tap for wine um, but yeah, that's a, a classic tree found, a pioneer tree, uh, will form birch woodlands of an area which has been recently left fallow, for instance, the, the birch will colonise and replicate really, really effectively as this young woodland here from an old wood pasture has become a, a woodland. Classic um, edible woodland flower, um, wood sorrel. Likes damp, shady places, classic woodland, ancient woodland indicator. And that at night, the flowers close as do the leaves. So they'll fold up, but the leaves have got this lovely lemon scent or lemon taste to them, a really strong flavor. So it's uh, one to look out for now. They like dead logs and dead um, places like that, very rich, fertile soils. Um, so uh, yeah, more acidic conditions than anything else. I think we've got two, two species to go now. So this is 
a dog violet. There are different types of dog violet. This is early dog violet. There's technicalities with them, but you can see it's a dog violet by the pointy canine like sepal that you get there. So that's like a canine tooth, hence the, the dog violet. Um, the leaves are important for uh, the larvae of fritillary butterflies. So again, classic woodland indicator species, and it's an important one to maintain that, that habitat. They grow overground with, with uh, like a, uh, a strawberry with overground runners, and they like uh, base rich woodlands and pastures. And then the very last species that we'll look at um, is this one, and it, it will follow a, a footpath uh, in a woodland. It will jump from woodland to another woodland, so it's, it's quite gregarious like that. Um, you look closely, it's like got four flowers in a cube and one on the top. So it's like a, a town hall clock is an old name for this species, which is Moschatel. Um, yeah, it readily colonizes, so it's damp and disturbed areas. And um, it's got a musk smell, hence its name comes from Latin or Italian, meaning musky odor. So that's obviously not com complete, but it's got a, a lot of different species that um, you'll see in your woodlands and all these different types of woodlands, wherever you are in the country. Um, if you want to learn more about trees, then I've got some cards which explain the characteristics uh, of the trees in these playing card form. And with the, the flowers, I've got a, a reciprocal pack for there. Trump cards, if trumps are your, your thing. Um, but basically, I've, I've got some resources if you wanted to learn more and have something that you could take with you in the field to learn about the characteristics and some of the stories behind the um, speeches. So as I said, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, it's the start of a five part series of which next week, Simon Rogers will be talking about managing the uplands, uh, the future for agriculture, conservation and recreation in Britain. Uh, then Paul Gannon will talk of 45 minutes, four and a half billion years of world history. Uh, Sophie Williams is going to talk about upland birds, what you're going to find in the mountains and the moorlands in the UK. So uh, fantastic. I'm really excited about that one. And then finally, wild food and foraging, it'll be the time of year to look at some of the, uh, the plants and look at how we can use them to make um, you know, uh, nice foods and, and adorn salads and things like that. So uh, Thank you very much for uh, attending tonight. I know we just slipped over an hour, but I hope you found that interesting. I will share the presentation with you uh, afterwards. So I'll send a link out to everyone uh, if you're interested in seeing some of those maybe at your own pace. Um, was there anything that really cropped up, Marion, in terms of questions? No, there was. A there was a bit of information that uh, books and suggestions and things, but no actual questions for you. But there was there was a few, as I say. I can put a couple of the resources that I use in the talk. I'll I can put them into a um, I'll put them in a list with a link to the presentation, so you can see some of the sources that I've used for this evening. So thank you all very much for uh, attending. Um, I'll respond to any questions af afterwards, but uh, yeah, thank you again. Enjoy your evening and enjoy the woodlands. And hopefully that's inspired you to take a closer look at some of the uh, beautiful wildlife that we've got in our British woodlands. Okay, hopefully we'll see you again. Okay, bye-bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>